Western European ideal once refused to send a bigot. You don't have divine right of kings, which is dub. Europe as a concept is not very silly. Straight or gay or in between. The nature of the competition. So, to start this story about Eurovision and nationalism, I want to begin in one of the far eastern extremes of what is considered Europe in Georgia. Now, their 2020 entry, Tornoki Kipiani's Take Me As I Am, certainly one of the more, like, left-field entries of that year. It wasn't really liked at the time. It's quite intense. Over the course of three minutes, he starts shouting and saying I love you in French, Spanish, English, German and, and Italian and asks you, the listener, why he has to speak like an Englishman, dress like an Italian, dance like a Spanish man, smell like a French homme, and play like a German. Now, it's one of the more overtly political entries from that year, and the message it's sort of sending is he, as a Georgian, as someone from the far east of Europe, is asking people in Europe why he has to pretend to be something he's not to be accepted, why he has to kind of pander to Western European tastes to be accepted. Now, you could read this song as almost a parody of Eurovision and a reflection on Eurovision's hypocrisy. And I suppose of, if you want to take a bit further, of Europe's hypocrisy. You know, Kipiani is in a European competition. He represents a European country. Yet he's asking why he cannot be Georgian in that space, why he has to be something else. He's kind of saying, look, your idea of being European isn't my idea of being European. You have exported this version of Western Europeanism to our country and tried to make us conform to it. I decided to start with the story because it shows how Eurovision is inherently linked to national stories and nationalism. Sure, it's a silly song contest, but it doesn't really matter. But it's also an international space where the focus is on nations, with 40 countries on stage competing to prove their cultural superiority to each other. Through this, we can watch modern Europe's relationship to its nations play out on stage. It allows the continent to be national, but in a peaceful way. When an artist goes to Eurovision to represent a certain country, Something weird happens to them. Regardless of their intentions, their hope for their career, their training and their songs meaning to themselves, they become representations, personifications of their nation. See, so Eurovision is a space where individuals don't interact, but nations do. It's not Torniki Kipiani's new track, it's George's song this year. And as these individuals become the personifications of their nations, so do their songs. No longer is Lena just a singer who won a song competition. She is the personification of Germany making amends for its past and represents a vision of the new, better Europe. The fact that these artists don't go individually, but are sent at the behest of their national broadcasters certainly helps with this. You know, they're not independent artists most of the time going on their own money. They are going at the request of a national broadcaster, an institution which is often partly or fully funded by the state and the taxpayer and are quite often extensions of national government institutions like Ministries for Culture. This means that the governments themselves, or the nations themselves, get some form of veto power over what gets performed on the European stage and what represents them. This veto power has been used quite a lot. For example, France in the 70s refusing to send a Serge Gainsbourg song because it was too racy. Uh, Belarus has done this quite a few times in the past 15 years most notably in 2021 when they were banned from the competition. Ukraine has made quite a habit of this in the past 15 to 17 years. Crimea is Ukraine. Ukraine, of course. OK. And even Germany once refused to send a bigot because, well, they selected him and it turned out he was massively racist. And whether you agree or not with all that, just the fact of making nations and by proxy different cultures compete is something that is super interesting about Eurovision. This is going to get a bit dense and a bit academic, but I promise you it will be interesting. Before we go any further, I have to set out my definition of what nationalism is. Now, in the modern political scene, nationalism is seen as something quite extreme and dangerous, the reserve of far-right nationalist parties and independence movements. But for me, nationalism in the everyday banal way is more of a way of being 
rather than a way of thinking or a political movement. It's a simple act of being part of a nation, accepting that you live in a nation and feeling invested in it. You know, feeling proud or ashamed, going out and voting because you want to express what your vision of your nation is, your nationalism. And in the same way, Eurovision is a nationalist endeavour, not because it has these big moments of like ethnic representation or national conversations, although they do matter, just because it's got a bunch of nations performing together in one space, therefore reinforcing and reifying the idea of nations existing in Europe and Europe being a community of nations. But the thing about nationalism is that when it started out, it was quite a dramatic and revisionist way of seeing the world, and it caused a lot of damage. Indeed, it was nationalism that tore apart Europe over the course of the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. It was nationalism that started the two world wars that provoked countless genocides. And by the mid-1950s, around the same time as Eurovision started, Europe had had enough of nationalism and the kind of divisiveness that it causes. And so it set up things like the European coal and steel community to stop France and Germany from fighting over the Rhineland. Now this evolved over about 30 to 40 years to become the European Union and also other things like the European Free Trade Agreement, you know, the European Monetary Union, the Schengen Zone, Interrail, Erasmus, all institutions and communities that set the boundaries of the modern Europe and encapsulate pretty much all of what we now consider to be Europe. And although these institutions and communities have done a lot to further the idea of a united Europe and unified Europe under one banner, they never really got rid of nationalism. People still felt national, people still felt proud of their nations and wanted to serve their nation's self-interests. And that's one of the existential issues that Europe faces. Is it a series of nations all looking to further their own self-interests, working together to create trade agreements and a new community? Or is it one continent moving together in history forward? Is it an internationalist endeavour or a nationalist endeavour? This blockage is very visible when we talk about identity. Despite the fact that lots of people do feel European, it has never been more than about 40% of Europe and never been more important for Europeans than either their regional or national identities. Of course, identity is dialogical and people can have multiple identities in multiple times. But if you ask your average European how European they feel, you'll get different answers from different regions in a single country, never mind across the span of a whole continent. Fundamentally, the defining awkwardness of building a new Europe is that it can never be a melting pot, where all are mixed and what results is something new. It must always be a smorgasbord, or even a game of Tetris. And that, ultimately, is what brings us to Eurovision. Reportedly, the founder of the European project, Jean Monnet, said that if he were to do it all again, he would start with culture. And nowhere does European culture quite like Eurovision. Why? Because for one week every year, 40 plus nations in Europe and Asia compete to see who can produce the best song coming up against each other to prove cultural superiority in a setting where, honestly, nothing really matters. But I hear you cry. Eurovision is a silly song contest that is tacky and cliched, full of politics and terrible music. And yes, it definitely is that. But alongside that, its role as a cultural intersection for the new Europe, and the power of that, should never be overlooked. The power and the intrigue of Eurovision, for me, isn't necessarily in the more extreme expressions of culture and nation. It is in how banal cultural interchange becomes on the Eurovision stage. There's something legitimate and authentically European about how Barbara Pravi's Voila and Goe's Shum shared the bill in 2021, as much as the meeting of Moldova's Dubci Dub and Iceland's Sista was in 2022. In no other circumstance would such musical and cultural contrast be so accepted as so totally standard and banal to the extent that the major intrigue is how an up-tempo folk rock number followed a string of ballads, not how diverse these means of national expression are. It allows, promotes and rewards Europe for being diverse, for being national, just as much as it rewards it for being international and European. It is all things to all Europe's. And acts like Tony Kikipiani may despair at how localised this vision of Europeanness is. But Eurovision gives the space to viewpoints like that, the neutral three minutes, to express that, articulate it, and change and adjust the cultural definition of what Europe is to allow the party to keep on growing. Obviously, this is sometimes awkward. And you can see how certain nations, in their struggle with that kind of aspect of European culture, let the conversation move into the realm of actually mattering. Like, for example, Turkey, Hungary, or Russia, who have all left. The brand of Europeanness expressed by Eurovision can become contentious because of its banality, and it is an easy target for people with an agenda against the concept of Europe to focus on. It is also regularly used to whitewash reputations and to divert from issues. 
In 2020 as well, Effendi from Azerbaijan, in her song Cleopatra, included the line, straight or gay or in between, which was a nice kind of cultural and ideological counterpoint to Azerbaijan's state-sanctioned homophobia. This could be subversive, but seeing how involved the Azeri state has been in Eurovision, it should also be read as a way of projecting an image of a nation who, on a political level, is engaging in a sort of national pinkwashing. Eurovision becomes to each nation what Europe is to it. A battleground, a space of internationalism, a space to show off and be proud. And because it doesn't really matter, it has become a testing ground for Europeanness more generally. This is the first place we see the Balkans, the Baltics and the rest of the former Soviet Union assert themselves and take ownership of the European stage and discourse. Arguably, we consider these nations as European more easily as a result of how they contribute to things like Eurovision. When Estonia won, the president made a note of this being the start of his nation's arrival as a European nation, showing us how this can matter, but in a more positive way. And this, I believe, is ultimately a good thing. The EU is flawed and arguably far too complicated to fully reach its potential, but Eurovision manages to straddle the nationalist-internationalist divide better than anything, and keep that idealised version of a diverse yet unified Europe alive. It remains in a great many ways true to its origins, making strides to be more inclusive and reactive to Europe's nuances as it develops in leaps and bounds. Issues do arise, but when they do it tends to be in a rather fringe way, allowing the more awkward conversations about nation to play out and reach their conclusions in rather benign ways. Take a look at North Macedonia, who this year has kind of suffered a full-blown national breakdown as a result of their contestant throwing their flag. Now, just in the past few weeks, they have adopted recommendations on how to better approach Eurovision and how to better cement themselves within that European cultural space. One of the reasons I love Eurovision so much is because of how well it celebrates Europe's diversity. It allows us to learn about nations and places we might never have heard of before and form opinions on them, not based on their national politics or what we think of them as countries, but because of the songs they send and how they contribute to the world of Eurovision. It's peaceful and fun, like the new Europe needs to be. Europe and what it's trying to do is quite political, it's quite heavy, it's quite dense, it's quite hard to love, but Eurovision and displays of nation and culture are something that we can really attach ourselves to. We need idealism, we need this idealised version of nations where conflict and pride are normal and peaceful to be able to move forward as a continent. And maybe we need a song contest where nothing really matters to have that idealism realised. We should all enjoy the fact that we get to keep on doing it. Thank you.